Okay. So good morning, everybody. Um, today, what we're going to be talking about is ionic compounds, and we're going to be talking about uh, just basically, you know, how to know if two elements are going to make an ionic compound. Which some of that will be review. Uh, we're going to talk about how to. Oops, somebody just disappeared. That's not great. Okay, well, if they're not here at the end, then they're not here. I hate to say that, but um, we're going to talk about how to uh, name an ionic compound if you're given a formula, or how to write the formula for one if you're given the name. Um, we're going to be making use of some reference materials, which I posted over on Google Classroom, and <clears throat> which you're welcome to either look at digitally, or you're welcome to print out later but I do have paper copies of all of those to give to you when you come back. So uh, just for today, kind of stick with me, uh, watch what I do, and again, if you've got any questions, stick them up in the chat. So uh, first of all, we had several people uh, read the chapter and ask, well, if there's no such thing as an ionic bond, why do we call it an ionic bond? Uh, and that's a great question. The reason we call it an ionic bond is because it's a lot easier to say ionic bond than it is to say um, ionic weak electrostatic attractive forces. Uh, the, and the big difference, and the reason why the author says what he says, is that when you have a covalent bond, you've got two atoms that are sharing electrons in a single direction. Okay, And so there is a definite locking on in that direction between those two atoms. Whereas with an ionic uh, compound, you've got positive ions and you've got negative ions. And you don't just have atom to atom. You've got a positive ion that is attracting negative ions in all directions. Uh, and likewise, you have negative ions that are attracting positive ions in all directions. So instead of getting you know, something like a linear molecule or a bent molecule like we looked at last week, uh, you tend to get crystals. You tend to get uh, positive ions like uh, these little sodiums here, negative ions like these little chlorines here, and they tend to attract each other in all directions. And so as a result, instead of getting molecules, you end up getting crystals. You end up getting uh, lots and lots of each of those kinds of ions. And uh, the shape here is not something like you're going to find on a Vesper chart. The shape here is determined by the size of all those positive and negative ions. So like something like sodium chloride here, because of the sizes of the atoms, they end up forming little cubes. And it's at the atomic level that that's determined. Um, so the way you can tell if something's going to be uh, I'm going to say bonded because it's easier. The way you can tell something's going to be bonded ionically is that you're going to have a metal and you're going to have a non-metal. And the metal, remember metals tend to be on the left-hand side of the periodic table. They tend to have one or two or three valence electrons and they tend to hold on to them very loosely. And so uh, they are going to be uh, ripped off basically by nonmetals who only need one or two or three more to complete uh, their outer valence shell, okay, to get that set of eight. Um, we had a question come up about what the octet rule was. The octet rule is that in order for an atom to be stable, it needs to have eight valence electrons in its outermost energy level, okay, or in its valence level or its valence shell. And it will do that either by stealing, like you saw here, or by giving away the one or two or three that it has in order to kind of fall back to the last level under that, which was complete. So um, when you have an ionic compound, it's always going to consist of a positive piece and a negative piece. A uh, positive piece, let me see if I can find a way for this to let me write here. Yes, okay. Maybe. I could just use pen. Yeah, that's fine. Um, the positive piece we refer to as the cation. I'm writing with the mouse, so please be patient with me. It's going to be ugly. 
is going to be that slow though. I had some people, whoa, that's not what I wrote at all. Ah, oh dear. Okay, the cation is going to be the positive ion. The negative ion is the anion. Yes, you will. I am trying to run way too many things on this computer at the same time. But uh, so if you've got something like sodium chloride, uh, one thing to keep in mind is when you are given either the name or the formula of an ionic compound, the positive piece is always going to be the one that comes first. The negative piece will be what comes second. So if you've got sodium chloride, the sodium, or the Na, yeah, that's what I wrote, is the positive part, the cation, the Cl, is the chloride ion, that's the anion. I don't know why I'm writing in Klingon there, but, you know, just kind of bear with. And so, uh, both on the periodic table that you annotated and also on one of the reference charts that you're going to be looking at, uh, we use something called oxidation or oxidation states, oxidation numbers, as a way to kind of predict what charge those ions are going to have when you make an ionic substance. Uh, I'm going to pop up to my camera real quick. And this chart right here, which again, you're going to be getting a copy of, this is what's called an oxidation chart. And the way that this is used is I've got all of the positive ions, or a lot of the positive ions, not all of them, but all the ones you're likely to run into in this class, uh, listed on the left-hand side of the table in a box with their charges. I've got all the negative ions listed on the right-hand side of the table in boxes with their charges. And so uh, you can use this uh, to kind of see what kind of charge each of these substances will tend to have. Now there are some rules that go along with this. Uh, I show you this one because the system for naming ionic compounds is a little more complicated than the one for naming covalent. So we're going to get the tough one out of the way first, and then later this week we'll come back and look at the covalent, which is a little bit different, but in a lot of ways it's a little bit easier. Uh, but anyway, when I'm referring to oxidation, just know that I'm looking at this chart. So a lot of this is going to be familiar to you, because on your periodic table, if you look here in the positive one box, for instance, look who I've got here. I've got hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, francium. All of those are in that first column on your periodic table over in group one. Uh, several that are here in positive two, we have beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium. Those are the ones that are in group two. So some of this you already know because you already have it on your periodic table. But you also see some other things popping up on this left-hand side. You see how some of these have got a little Roman numeral in parentheses? The reason for that is that some of these substances can actually have more than one oxidation state. A lot of these that have little Roman numerals by them are the ones that you tend to find over in the uh, middle region of your periodic table, over here in the D block or down here in the F block. And they can actually have multiple uh, energy states when they form bonds based on how many electrons that they're actually going to be losing. And we'll look at some examples of that. It'll make a whole lot more sense, I hope, uh, after we do. Uh, but for right now, let me hop back into my presentation. So again, oxidation, like I said, you can predict some of it, like this first group right here. The only possible oxidation that they can have is plus one. 
all of these, and the second one, the only possible oxidation they can have is plus two. Because all of these here in this first chart, if you remember their dot diagram, they've got a single valence electron that they're going to be giving away. All of these in the second column, remember they've got a pair of S electrons that they're going to be giving away. Now beyond that, it's a little bit of the Wild West. Uh, most of the ones in this column, they tend to have an oxidation of plus three because they have three valence electrons, but there are some exceptions to the rule, especially when you start getting to this little stair-step line over here because some of them tend to act like metals, some tend to act like non-metals, some of them can act like either depending on the situation that they're in. And so you have things here like boron, you know, it's plus three, you have aluminum, the only thing that it can be is plus three. But then you get to something like gallium, and I think gallium can, nope, gallium is always only plus three. Beyond, that should be a G. Beyond that, you start getting into sort of a mixture of your metals and your non-metals. You get some of your metalloids. And so, for instance, carbon. Carbon actually has multiple oxidation states. If it's going to be bonding ionically, it could be positive four. In some cases, it can actually be positive two. And in some other cases, it can actually be negative four. And really, the only way to know which one it's going to be is to examine who it's bonded to. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to look at some examples. We'll come back to polyatomic ions here in just a minute. No, I think I'll talk about polyatomic ions right now. So the word polyatomic. Okay, poly is from a root. It literally means many or multiple. Atomic just means atoms. Sometimes in ionic bonding, you have groups of atoms that pretend to be single atoms. And so uh, for our purposes, we just consider them to be like a single atom. And I've got a great video clip I like to show with this, and I'll put it up when I post... Uh, this video later. Uh, it's from the Muppet movie. And polyatomic ions, if you've ever seen the Muppet movie, they act a lot like Muppet Man. And if you have no idea what that means, I'll show you the video later. Or you can pull the video later off of Google Classroom, and it'll make a lot more sense. Um, so here's an example. Uh, you've got the carbonate ion. The carbonate ion is made up of one uh, carbon atom, uh, which is actually covalently bonded to three oxygen atoms, but the only way that you can bond a carbon to three oxygen atoms is to throw away two electrons so that there's a place for all of them to fit. So the entire cluster of atoms here actually has a total charge of minus two. So we refer to this as a carbonate ion, and we treat it like we would treat a single atom. If you look on this ion chart here in the negative two column, there's CO3, and the name is written right there. It's written as carbonate. And so let me jump back over to that. So take a look at this compound right here. Okay, the formula is CaOH2. Now, a couple things to notice. Um, the OH is in parentheses with two on the outside. The parentheses here are a real good indication that I've got a polyatomic ion, like we saw on that last screen. Uh, like I told you earlier, every ionic compound is going to have a positive part, okay, which in this case is the first one written, okay. So this uh, Ca is going to be my positive piece. It's my cation. That means that everything else here is going to be my negative piece, or my anion. So in order to name this, what I need to do is I need to either go to my periodic table or go to my ion chart 
and try and find this piece and try and find this piece. Uh, when I do, I find that the CA is in the plus 2 column and it has a, a uh, oxidation of positive 2. Uh, the OH is in the negative 1 column and it has the name hydroxide. Okay, so we call it the hydroxide ion. And if you're like, where is he getting all that from? Okay, so in the positive 2, there's calcium. If I come over here to the negative 1, I have to hunt around for a little bit, but in the negative 1 column, there's OH, and it's called hydroxide. So all I have to do to name this is I name the positive piece, I name the negative piece. And so this compound is called calcium hydroxide. That's awfully easy. Yes, it does get slightly harder, but not too much harder. Okay? Uh, things start getting a little strange when you start dealing with some of those metals that can have more than one possible positive charge. And we'll look at some of those here in just a minute. I've got a few examples we're going to try and tackle. But before we do that, let me show you another one of those resources that I gave you. Zoom back out here. This right here is a flowchart uh, for naming inorganic compounds. And so for the ones that we're going to be dealing with today, we're not dealing with covalent, but you can start at the left-hand side over here, and you can answer each of these questions, and it'll kind of walk you through step-by-step step how you need to name that. So let me see if I can kind of split my view here a little bit. Yeah, totally. Okay. So let's take a look at this first compound right here. The formula is NABR. So positive piece uh, is going to be the first thing I come to. Negative piece is going to be the second thing I come to. So I look up both of those on my ion chart. I should by now recognize that NA is sodium, because I've seen it before. And it says it has a charge of plus 1. Uh, BR, if I've got one sodium and I've got one BR, if I know that sodium is plus 1, then it's a safe bet that my other one is going to be an equal and opposite charge, which in this case is going to be minus 1. So I'm going to look over in the minus 1 column and see if I find BR. And sure enough, there it is. It says the name of that ion is bromide. So to name this, all I have to do is say the positive piece and the negative piece. So this is just going to be sodium bromide. Let's run a little more smoothly. I wonder what I did. And so that one's easy. Uh, now, looking at this next one, this next one might be a little more complicated. Okay, Same thing we're going to do. We know that the first thing that we come to is going to be our positive piece. That's our cation, this SC. And we know that the OH is going to be our negative piece. So the SC, when we go to look it up on our ion chart, hunting around for it, on the periodic table, I can look it up, and I know that it's scandium. Okay. All right. Actually, this isn't going to be too hard. There's scandium. Scandium only appears here on my positive three. And so uh, I get the name from the periodic table. Scandium OH. We saw that one a minute ago. I look on the negative side to find OH, and it's named hydroxide. So this is just going to be scandium hydroxide. I know this is painful to watch. Okay. 
Oh, I lost somebody else. Okay. Now, things start getting interesting when you... Okay, now it is going to get interesting for number three here. So take a look at this one. We have V2, SO4, 3. Positive piece comes first. That's going to be V. I look up on my periodic table, and I see that V is vanadium. SO4. I'm going to look up on my chart. There's SO4 right there. It says that it's called sulfate. Now, I think it's a good point for me to mention that spelling is extremely important when you're doing this kind of thing, because if you look right next to sulfate, right above that, you've got something called sulfide. Something underneath that you've got called sulfite. They're all very different, so it's going to be super important that you are uh, checking your spelling and not making any spelling mistakes here. So sulfate, according to this, has a charge of minus 2. Now I'm going to talk about why that's important. So sulfate here, I'm going to just kind of make myself a note. It's got a charge of minus 2. Now when I go to look for vanadium, or V, on my chart, I have a little bit of a problem because V shows up right there in positive 2. V also shows up right there in positive 3. Let's see. V also shows up in positive 4. And V shows up in positive 5. Maybe some other places. So vanadium, if you look on the periodic table, it's one of these that's here in the D block that's out in no man's land. And so it's one of those that can actually have multiple different oxidation states. And so I can't just say vanadium sulfate because just that name doesn't tell me which vanadium I'm dealing with. So here I've got to think a little bit harder. Um, I've got to figure out, okay, so what is my total charge on the negative side of this formula? Each SO4 group is worth negative 2, but I've got 3 of them. So if I look at the total negative charge here, the total negative charge for this side is actually negative 6. Now the rule is that for this to be a valid uh, ion compound, the negatives and the positives have to both add up to zero. So that means that on this side, I've got to have a total charge of positive 6. Now that positive 6 has to be divided out evenly over all the atoms that are on this side. And if you look here, I've just got two vanadium atoms. So if I take this total positive 6, divide by 2, that means that each of these vanadium atoms is actually contributing positive 3. Okay. I know that that was a lot to go over. I'll show you a different way to think about that here in just a minute. But the important thing is when I go to my ion chart, this is going to be new. When I look down in my positive 3 and I see vanadium down here, I see that it's got a little Roman numeral 3 out beside it. What that tells me is that when I write this name, in order to show which vanadium I'm talking about, because there's lots of them, I have to write the Roman numeral in the name. So I write vanadium. Now I'm going to put the Roman numeral 3 for this uh, charge of positive 3 here in parentheses, and I said that SO4 was sulfate. Again, I got that name off of my ion chart. And that's my correct answer. Yes, you do have to be sure and include that Roman numeral if there's a Roman numeral beside the symbol on the charter. What that means is since there's more than one possible oxidation, you have to tell which one it is when you're given the name. It's tricky. We're going to do lots and lots of practice on it. Um, what I want to look at real quick, though, is I want to look at what if you're going the other direction? What if you are 
give it a name, and you have to write the formula. Okay? On the other side of that chart that I included, or actually it's a separate document that came through on your end, um, I've actually got what's called the rules for writing formulas. And so we're going to kind of follow along with this to help us figure this out. Uh, let's look at this first one here, lithium acetate. So the first thing I do is I find the charge of lithium and I find the charge of acetate. I know the first thing that's written has to be positive something. It's my cation. And I know the second one has to be negative something. It's my anion. And I know that the charges have to add up. Sometimes, actually a lot of times, it's easier to find the negative. Really? It's easier to find the negative than it is to find the positive. So I'm going to go ahead and look at my chart, and I'm going to find acetate. And these are listed out in each column alphabetically, so I look toward the top of each column, and hey, acetate jumps out at me real quick. It's at the top of the negative 1 column, and it has the formula C2H3O2. So I know that acetate has a charge of negative 1. Lithium, when I look at my chart, There it is. It's in the positive one. And so I know that lithium has a charge of plus one. So I'm going to do what this chart here calls the crisscross rule. Okay. Above each symbol, I'm going to write the correct oxidation number. So lithium is plus one, acetate is minus one. And I'm going to crisscross those down and drop the sign. So in other words, this one is going to come down for acetate, this one is going to come down for lithium. So I end up with one lithium and one acetate. So I don't have to write Li1, C2H3O2, 1. I just, since it's just one of each, I just write Li for lithium and C2H3O2 for acetate. And again, that comes off of this chart. Okay, Acetate has the formula C2H3O2. This entire piece has a charge of minus 1. This piece has a charge of plus 1. So everybody's happy. Let me show you another couple examples here because another couple examples make a little more sense. So here we've got iron 2-phosphate. Okay, Now, if it gives you the Roman numerals that's great because you don't have to go look it up on a table. It tells you what the charge of the positive piece is going to be. This iron is going to have a charge of plus 2. Okay, And I get that from the Roman numerals here. Okay, That tells me the charge of the positive ion. Phosphate, I do need to go look up. I know it's going to be on the negative side, so I start coming through the negative charts here until I find phosphate with a P. There it is. There's phosphate. It has a formula PO4, so it's a polyatomic ion, and it's got a charge of minus 3. So I know phosphates are going to be minus 3. Now, that crisscross rule I was talking about, what this tells me is that I'm going to take this 2, and I'm going to cross it down here, which means that I'm going to end up with two phosphates, I'm going to take this 3, cross it down here, which means I'm going to end up with 3 irons. Uh, my ratio of 3 to 2, I can't reduce to make it simpler. So I'm going to put the symbol for iron, which is Fe. I don't write the Roman numeral in the formula. Super important. Mistake people make a lot. The Roman numeral only goes in the name. You never write it in the formula. I'm going to take this 3 that I cross over from phosphate, and I'm going to put it right here as a subscript on iron. So it's going to be Fe3. Now phosphate, on the chart, it tells me the phosphate is PO4. But this tells me that I'm going to have two of those. So what I have to do is I have to put this in parentheses and put a 2 on the outside. Now, just to check to make sure we did this right, we look at our total charge. If each iron has a charge of plus 2, 
and there's three of them, that means I've got a total charge of positive 6. If each phosphate has a charge of minus 3, but I've got two of them, then negative 3 times 2 means my charge is going to be negative 6. So yes, I did it right. My charges add up. Okay. Uh, let's look at maybe one more here. Uh, let's look at... Hmm. I'll tell you what, in the chat, you vote. Do you want to see 23, 24, 25, 26, or 27? Okay. The first vote that gets, uh, or the first choice that gets two votes, uh, I will go with that one. Oh, I vote for 27. Again, working from the logic that the one that's furthest down is always the hardest one. All right, well, I'm glad that 27 came up. Looks like I've got three votes for 27, so let's look at beryllium hydroxide. So uh, I don't see a Roman numeral here, so that tells me that beryllium is only going to have one possible oxidation. So I'm going to go take a look at my chart, and I'm going to see if I can find beryllium on my chart. Symbol is BE. Let's see, where are you, Brilliant? There it is. It's at the top of positive 2. So I know the beryllium is going to have a charge of plus 2. Let me write that down. Hydroxide, we've seen before. So I know it's negative, and I'm pretty sure I saw it over in negative 1. Yep, there it is. Hydroxide has the formula OH, and it's negative 1. So hydroxide's minus 1. I'm going to use my crossing over rule to take this 2, which means I'm going to need two hydroxides. Take this 1, which means I'm going to need one beryllium. So I'm going to write one beryllium. It's just BE. Why that did that? I don't have to write 1 because if there's only 1, you don't have to put a number to it. Hydroxide is OH. But again, this tells me that I need two of these. So since this is a polyatomic, I'm going to put it in parentheses. Now I'm going to put a 2 on the outside of it right there. So my formula for beryllium hydroxide is BEOH in parentheses 2. I've been talking for about 33 straight minutes, and so uh, at this time, if you've got any questions that I can answer immediately for you about anything that we've seen so far, uh, I would love to uh, check that. Don't go anywhere yet. Uh, but if you don't have any questions, then at this point you are free to cut out. I have taken a screenshot to see if you're actually still here. So uh, you are done for the day. Tomorrow in the Zoom, I'm going to have some practice problems for us to work together. Uh, if you want to tune in and work along with us, that's great, or you can always catch it on the video. Uh, don't see any questions popping up in the chat yet. So I think at this point I'm going to wish you all a good day. Hang in there. Hope to see you soon. Okay. On the thing, why don't you put the numbers in the formula? Why don't you put the Roman num numerals in the formula? Because the way that this formula is set out, like if you look at this one here, this Fe3PO42, I know that iron can have different charges. It can either be iron 2 or it can be iron 3. But the fact that it's bonded to two of these guys and there's three of them, the only possible thing that makes sense is that this would have to be iron too. Okay, The Roman numeral tells you what the charge of the positive is. If you're going the other way and looking at the formula, you figure out what the charge is based on how many negatives it's stuck to. I don't know if that answer helped at all. We'll do some more examples tomorrow. Maybe it'll make sense then. Okay.
Anybody else? All right, they are dropping like flies. Okay, I, I'm going to head out. All right, see you, Reed. Y'all have a good day.